Hello and welcome to my review of Dispatches by Michael Hare, which was published in 1977, two years after the end of the Vietnam War. Now Hare had started his writing career with Esquire, and he used his contacts there to get press credentials with which to cover the Vietnam War. Dispatches is a hard book to describe. Usually I would start these videos with a description of the main plot points, but Dispatches simply doesn't have any. It is instead separated into six sections, with little to distinguish between them in terms of style or content. Most of the first two and the last section represent a kind of stream of consciousness with Hare offering his thoughts on various things related to the war though you might expect with such a narrative to drift into various concepts and themes, the first section particularly is repetitive in the extreme, seeming to be just there searching for the best way of communicating the same feeling. In a literary sense, what this actually means is he simply says the same thing over and over in slightly different ways. The problem was that you didn't know what you were seeing until later, maybe years later, that a lot of it never made it in at all, just stored itself in your eyes. Time and information, rock and roll, life itself, the information isn't frozen, you are. This is already a long time ago. I can remember the feelings, but I can't still have them. A common prayer for the overattached. You'll let it go sooner or later, why not do it now? Memory print, voices and faces, stories like filament through a piece of time, so attached to the experience that nothing moved and nothing went away. The first section is particularly heavy going, weighing in at some 50 pages characterised by a small, densely packed typeface. And as you no doubt noticed, Hare never uses five words when 15 can do the same job. However, the fixated, reiterative nature of the text does make you wonder if this is representative of some kind of PTSD. Writing a novel as therapy is hardly a new concept, and here, as in most cases, the resulting text wavers close to the red lines of both tedium and repetition for anyone not sharing the personal experience. Now, regular viewers may have seen this before. For a novel to be worth the investment of your time you're making when you sit down to read it, it has to tick at least one of these boxes. A good book may tick all three, but a great book may tick only one. But as long as one of them gives a passing grade, the book will have some value. I think we've established already that dispatches has no plot by my definition of the word. It is anecdotal at times. It tells of brief encounters with various peoples, soldiers, uh, officers, and the other journalists involved in Vietnam. Certainly there is a story here that the war was characterised by deadly incompetence and a total disregard for human life, for example. That Hare's credentials come from Esquire says something about the Vietnam War, as does the proliferation of song lyrics in the text. The aesthetics of the war became more important and utterly detached from the reality of it. Commanders quoting jargon and media spin Exaggerating and obfuscating the truth about casualty numbers became so routine that Hare observes that he couldn't tell if the various colonels tasked with briefing the media had any idea what had actually happened. So, story certainly, opinion definitely, but no plot. Like I say, there's probably some commentary there. In terms of characters, most drift in and out of the text, often for little more than a paragraph. Rarely are they named beyond the self penned graffiti that they add to their helmets. Two that crop up more often than others are Daytripper and Mayhew. Their recurring presence makes the Kaysan section by far the strongest. The absence of names, though, is troubling. Certainly it seems disrespectful. It may even have been financially motivated, which would be more appalling, in that if nobody is named, they can't make a claim on your profits. Hare himself, though, characterises it as a distancing, a self-protection, if you like, in that he cannot find out the fate that befell the people that he cared about. I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt, though it is difficult at times. The problematic nature of the text is further exacerbated by Hare himself, particularly when, as narrator, he lays on so thick and heavy his war is hell, woe is me mantra, because he's not a soldier but a journalist, able to come and go as he pleased for the most part, and in Vietnam of his own free will, sheltered from the worst but by no means all of the danger. His text is enormously self-indulgent, especially in the first section as shown, and Despite his intention, it marginalises the, the infantry by excluding their names and any up-close or personal account of their exploits. Additionally, the anti-racism message of Illumination Rounds, which details the mistreatment and lack of consideration shown to the Vietnamese people, is rather undermined by Hare calling a black marine a spade on more than one occasion. Perhaps this is social commentary. After all, how can we win the hearts and minds of a foreign nation when we are mistreating our own people? But it's not always easy to give her that much credit. 
War in Herzberg is an abstract concept, and despite his searching, it's unexplainable in simple words, and Herr seems often more interested in his own prose than retelling the stories of the soldiers who seem better placed to explain the unexplainable. Because it's autobiographical, it's hard to characterise his dispatches as lacking a protagonist, but it sidelines its heroes in favour of questionable self-pitying. What is undeniable, however, is the emotional impact of the text. Of course, with so much media available to us in text, fictionalised or not, in movies and documentaries, there will always be a huge amount of intertextuality around anything to do with Vietnam. Even just names like Khe San, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the Viet Cong, come with a huge amount attached to them. It's all highly evocative, and coupled with the blackest gallows humour of the troops, an example of which is on screen, it's hard not to occasionally be moved by even the brief stories that Hare tells of them. Once I ran into a soldier standing by himself in the middle of a small jungle clearing where I'd wandered off to take a leak. We said hello, but he seemed very uptight about my being there. He told me that the guys were all sick of waiting around and that he'd come out to see if he could draw a little fire. What a look we gave each other. I backed out of there fast. I didn't want to disturb him while he was working. Now, I'm not really sure if I should find this funny. Certainly, Hare's overblown style threatens to scupper his one-liner, but clearly the soldier in question is in great peril, and like so many young men of that time and place, battling some personal problems. Hare's commentary on the war itself, the ridiculous nature of hundreds of correspondents running around after the Marines with cameras or sipping wine in the relics of Vietnam's colonial past, is on point. Conventional journalism could no more reveal this war than conventional firepower could win it. All it could do is take the most profound event of the American decade and turn it into a communications pudding, taking its most obvious undeniable history and making it into a secret history. I think it's hard to write about Vietnam without some kind of emotional impact, and it is here that Dispatches is most successful, but it's always a struggle against her self-indulgence. This next section reads almost like a whodunit, deliberately stringing along its audience for three lengthy paragraphs before revealing the truth of the mysterious it, hidden behind a sneaky pronoun and a whole lot of waffle. But there was often that bad, bad moment to recall, that look that made you look away, and in its hateful way, it was the purest single thing I'd ever known. There was no wonder left in it anywhere, no amusement. It came out of nothing so messy as morality or prejudice. It had no motive, no conscious source. And there are three lengthy paragraphs in this vein. I'll skip to the last. You guys are crazy, that Marine had said, and I know that when we flew off of Mutter's Ridge that afternoon, he stood there for a long time and watched us out of sight with the same native loathing that he'd shown us before, finally turning to whoever was around, saying it maybe to himself, getting out what I'd actually heard said once when a jeep load of correspondents had just driven away, leaving me there alone, one rifleman turning to another and giving us all his hard, cold wish. Those f guys had said, I hope they f die. But someone see, needs to say to Hare, get to your point, Poirot, because grinding your way through Hare's verbose soup makes dispatches hard to read. For a war book, it is utterly devoid of any kind of heroism or glamorising of conflict, which no doubt explains some of its critical acclaim. I would be fascinated to know what the opinion of this book is from uh, veterans of the war. I suspect with its pop culture references and strong, if somewhat poorly handled, support of the foot soldiers over their commanders, it is probably well regarded. However, readers looking for a war book with any kind of action to go with its message should look elsewhere, and you don't have to look much further than Gustav Hasford's short timers, more on which in a second. The presence of so many correspondents like her might have helped the truth of the chaos and carnage that characterised the Vietnam War get out, but I find it hard to believe that the changed behaviour of the soldiers in their presence didn't also get people killed, and I find that hard to forgive. It certainly makes for a dubious group to try and lionise. The real people that we want to hear from, those fighting the war, are generally reduced by Hare to a few lines here or there, and often chosen for how that fits Hare's own stance, or how it can be used to make him look good. I may have given dispatches a passing grade, but it is a long, hard and slow read that makes it more or less impossible to recommend to anyone whose interest in Vietnam isn't focused narrowly on the experience of the press corps as opposed to the Marine Corps. So a few last words on the movie Full Metal Jacket, which I discussed in my short timers video. I read an anecdote, probably on Hasford's website, where he was on the set of Full Metal Jacket and somebody asked what he was doing there. When he replied, I wrote the book. The other person said, really? I think Dispatches is the best Vietnam book ever. Hasford claims to have taken that with a sardonic, so do I. But it is clear to me, having read both books now, that Hasford's novel is the source of the great majority of the movie, and Hare's effort contributes basically nothing beyond this passing line. 
Hasford was, by his own admission, difficult to deal with at times. That, I think, is why the movie studio made efforts to keep him at arm's length and occasionally further. However, there's a huge amount of disrespect involved in that. Disrespect to him as an author and also disrespect to him for his military service troubled as it was. Hare, as the non-soldier, I think, would certainly have been useful on set, with perhaps a more story-focused or dispassionate eye, but to suggest that dispatches contributed significantly to Full Metal Jacket is an enormous stretch. Check out my video on short timers, there's a link in the description for more on that. Thank you for watching, feel free to like and subscribe, and in the unlikely event of a Vietnam veteran stumbling across this review, please leave me your thoughts on dispatches in the comments, because I'd really love to hear them. Bye.